Good morning. Oh, oh, there's one person awake. All right, try it again. Good morning. <laughs> well, I do want to say welcome and thank you to those of you who uh, braved the snow to get here this morning. Um, I know that we um, have a number of you joining us on Facebook Live um, from around, including locally, um, because we've got this crazy weather here. So um, thank you for joining us. Those of you who are in person, um, uh, thank you. Those online, thank you. A few announcements as we get going uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, just a reminder that we have Sunday school that meets in the back corner of the classroom at 945, and we're doing a study on the Ten Commandments. Um, we will meet next Sunday for uh, Sunday school on December 18th. We will not have Sunday school on Sunday, December 25th, Christmas morning. But we will have our regular 11 o'clock service on Christmas morning. So uh, please join us for that. But no Sunday school that morning. Um, also, this week, uh, there is no prayer meeting on Wednesday. Uh, this Wednesday, December 14th. Uh, certainly, please pray. <laughs> you know, feel free to pray there. I'm not saying there's no prayer. Uh, there's just no official prayer meeting at my office this Wednesday. Uh, men's group. Uh, weather permitting and Lord willing, we are meeting this Friday, December 16th at Joe DeLeon's house um, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And we will be reading and discussing the second part of Matthew chapter 25. So guys, we'd love to have you join us for that. Um, also, uh, mark your calendars. Uh, this is in your bulletin, but just again, uh, good to have kind of the verbal heads up that on Sunday, December 18th, which is next Sunday, we will be going Christmas caroling. And so we'll meet here at the church at four o'clock. And then after Christmas caroling, we'll be going over to Kathy Scully's for fellowship and snacks. Then on Saturday, December 24th, we do have our Christmas Eve service here at the church at 4 p.m. Um, and then, like I said, we'll have Christmas morning, which is Sunday, December 25th, we'll have our 11 o'clock service. And then marking your calendar ahead on Sunday, January 8th, which is coming super quickly, uh, we will have our 2023 planning meeting right after church. Um, pizza lunch will pe be provided for you, um, and so I want to make you aware of that. Uh, so now another quick announcement uh, from Kathy Scully. And just to clarify, it is it the end of this week or the end of next week? No, the whole the end of this week because they would like to do other stuff next week. Okay. And right. all the wrapping stuff is already here. So I just need to get the stuff. <laughs> all right. So if you are interested in helping wrap, um, please talk to Kathy and she'll arrange uh, or talk to you about days and times. And uh, it doesn't all have to even coincide at one moment in time um, can be multiple sessions so that would be wonderful uh, just a reminder as well that our offering plate because we have our beautiful Christmas tree up the offering plate is now underneath the big giant bulletin board um, for this time and so uh, that's what we have uh, that is all I have for announcements and uh, if you would go ahead and stand uh, we will join together in worship singing
talk about um, the majesty of God. It says, O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens. Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, as though he had been anything else. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, and the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. So, as we sing, this is the God we worship, the God of the heavens. And today, he says, no.
turn on anything, you're going to hear a Christmas carol. And, um, you know, we hear the songs, and it's not just a sweet story about a little, a little baby in the manger. No, it was a little baby, and he was in the manger, but he grew up. And he fulfilled his purpose. He became the savior of the world. And that's why it is well with our souls. And that's why we have the opportunity to speak his powerful name into this dark world we live in. And sometimes our own lives get kind of blurry and dark. We're not um, exempt from dark, dark times. But we do not face those alone. And so we speak Jesus over those around us and know that the Spirit speaks Jesus over our hearts.
Lord, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and there is no other. Thank you for stepping down into this world for us. Hey, Nolan, do you want it? When I call you up here, do you and your brother and sister want to come up and light the candles? Do you guys want to do that? Okay. All right, cool. So today we, our scripture is in Isaiah. And if you know it, maybe you could say it with me. I'm going to read it because sometimes I get a little mixed up. By the way, good morning online. We're glad you're here. We're happy to see you. Um, this is Isaiah 4, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So that was Isaiah 9, sorry, that was Isaiah 9, 6. 
through seven. Thanks. Okay, so this morning I borrowed two very important things for my children. This is Teddy, so you can see him online, and this is Bunny. Now, this last week we celebrated our 12 year anniversary as a forever family. That means Magali and Miley became our children, we became their parents 12 years ago. And when they came to our home, these were different looking animals. <laughs> they were brand new. And you can tell they have been well loved, right guys? Like they have been loved. And so when the girls were afraid or scared at night, I'm sure, and other times they would hold these and snuggle them and that's why they look so beautiful. And they're actually quite squishy. So I'm gonna give my kids their stuffed animals back. There you go. You're welcome. So they have these cozy loveys that they've had for 12 years now and they've been well loved because sometimes when you're at night, did you guys ever get scared of the dark? Has that ever happened to you? I was really scared of the dark. I mean, I would do anything not to have to turn out my light at night. I strung a string up to the thing pulley and then I got the string and I would get all the way in my bed and then tuck in and then I would turn the light out so that I didn't have to go across my floor. That's how scared I was of the dark. Well, our scripture today, and actually the songs that we've been singing have been all about God's peace. And that we receive, God's peace comes from God, and we receive it through Jesus, and it's activated by the Holy Spirit. That's pretty cool. In the Bible, the word peace is shalom. And it's not talking about just kind of peace like people who are fighting, and now they're no longer fighting, although that can be peace. It means an overall well-being of your whole self with God, like this peace that encompasses everything. And that's not peace that you can create. It's only peace that can come from God. So I want to teach you a sign, a peace sign. Are you guys ready? My head is glowing. I will step forward. Okay. All right. So put your hands like this. You guys got it? And then put them together. So this can be like how we wring our hands and we get really worried. Like, oh, right? So we put our hands this way and go like this. And then we can Put it down before the Lord. So this is the ASL sign for peace. So we can try it one more time. This way and then down. And then we can imagine that in our minds as this is our worry and our concern and we can just lay it down before God. And he is going to provide our perfect peace in him. So here is one more word for our older, our older children at heart. If you are not fulfilled with God's peace, Miss Sarah likes to talk about getting curious. So what is it that's keeping you from feeling that peace and get curious with Jesus? Just tell him, I do not feel this peace, Jesus. And he will help guide you in the thing that's kind of getting in the way that's blocking that so you can lay it down and you don't have to carry it around anymore. Okay, Nolan, are you ready? Are you guys ready? You want to come up? Haley, do you want to come up? Yeah? Now you remind me your name again. Tyler. So we have some friends who are like candles with us. Spirit was moving when I got mixed up because I have the feeling that a few of us really need to be focused on what the peace that God has for us today. Let's pray. Dearest Lord Jesus, we thank you that you can drive out, that perfect love drives out fear, that we can have peace in you and that you can activate that through the Holy Spirit. We just pray for anyone here that you would meet them right where they are right now. If they are feeling anxious or worried, that you would give them shalom. 
um, an overall well-being that's rooted in you. And we thank you that during this time of kind of thinking about um, Jesus being born and celebrating his birthday, that we can kind of be reminded about the gifts that you give us, your hope, your joy, your peace. In your name we pray. Amen. this point in time we have the opportunity to go before God in prayer as a congregation and this is a time where I want to encourage you if you feel comfortable to lift up a prayer out loud a, a prayer of praise a prayer of thanks uh, a prayer of request and uh, again if you're not comfortable praying out loud uh, no problem I want to encourage you to just pray silently with us and if you're here this morning if you're online and you just feel like, I just don't know what to pray or how to pray, again, no problem, because Scripture tells us the Spirit will intercede on our behalf. Just before we go to prayer, I want to share a couple uh, prayers of praise, prayers of thanksgiving. Uh, the first is that this Friday, um, Kate Baker is graduating from high school. And so that's, yay! So... That is a prayer of praise. Um, and then on January 5th, she leaves for her uh, YWAM mission experience. And so again, that's both a prayer of praise and thanksgiving as well as a prayer uh, to go with you. And then another huge prayer of praise, uh, Kathy Taylor shared with me this morning that she went this last Tuesday to her oncologist appointment and her oncologist <laughs> told her after five and a half years that this was the last visit because she is now cancer free. So that's a huge praise. So let's go before God in prayer and pray as you feel led. Lord, we again just praise you and thank you for this time, this chance to be together. Lord, thank you that we can come directly to you as our Heavenly Father. You invite us, you encourage us to bring these prayers directly to you. Lord, we just again praise you for the chance to be together, to sing songs together of praise to you, to come before you in prayer, to learn from your word, to learn from you, from one another, and what you've taught uh, each one of us, to learn directly from your word, from your spirit. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for that. Lord, we do lift up these prayers of praise for Kate Baker. She graduates and heads out on her YWAM mission trip and just pray for your continued guidance. Thank you for all the ways that you've provided for her um, to actually get her classes done uh, for high school graduation, for the finances to help support her on her mission trip, uh, for her family and all that's ahead there and uh, their love and support and uh, be with um, all of the rest of the bakers as as Kate leaves and it's going to definitely leave a gap in their home and uh, in their lives and so we pray that you'd be with them too uh, Lord and we just also give you great uh, thanks and praise for the incredibly good news for Kathy Taylor and just thank you for your healing of her body and just uh, pray that you would keep her cancer free and uh, Lord, again, for many who are traveling right now with the snow and all, we pray for safety, uh, safe travel for them as they're heading, safe travel for all that are here this morning as they head home, um, and Lord, just all that is had. And so Lord, again, we praise you and thank you for this chance to come before you as a congregation and lift our prayers to you. So Lord, hear us now as we pray together.
paper, Mary. You know what's going on there with the breathing and the anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's almost to a point of having to have some kind of intervention. And I just pray that she will feel your hand on her today and give her peace. And that um, she will follow through with what needs to be done. Lord, we also give praise for Alex Saez, who had his final chemo treatment on Friday and got to ring the bell that he was done and just pray for complete healing for him as well. Lord, again, we praise you for the many, many blessings that you pour out upon us. Lord, we praise you that you continue to lead us and guide us and teach us. Lord, we pray that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to hear from you what it is that you want to teach us this day. And Lord, in all that we are and all that we do both individually as well as as a congregation Lord may you be glorified and so we lift this to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ Amen Alright children you are dismissed to Children's Church and as they head out let me put the screen down and we will have our scripture in verse and Overhead prayer. Our scripture reading today is from Psalm 19, 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The status of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from a comb. Please join me in prayer. As we come before you today, in the name of Jesus, we declare that you are God, and we will earnestly seek you. Father, it is our desire to see you in this sanctuary, to behold your power and your glory. Father, your love is greater than life, and our lips will glorify you. We will praise you as long as we live and we will lift up our hands in your name. <coughs> you have satisfied our souls, and with our lips we will give you praise. Amen. And if you will go ahead and stand, we will continue with our worship singing. So, um, I just love what Christiana is. Those are pretty ancient words. This is just right after the Exodus. So this is in 
Numbers chapter 6, the last bit. And this is the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So we have this rich heritage of ancient words, right? Numbers, Isaiah, Psalm, you know, the, the whole thing. So they do really keep us grounded and make all the difference in the world. So let's sing. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to today's passage, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look specifically at verses 6 and 7, although we're going to be looking at multiple places through scripture today. And the sermon title for today is Mary Had a Little Lamb. So let's read Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 together as we get started. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first bud, firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now when the prophet Malachi put away his quill and finished what we know as the last Old Testament book of the Bible, it would be the last word heard from God for the next 400 years. Between the last verse of Malachi and the first verse of Matthew, God did not speak. The heavens were silent. 
Now let me be clear. That doesn't mean that God was not at work. It just was those years of silence. Those years are known as the 400 years of silence. And during that time, there was no prophet, no revelation, no angelic messenger, no sign, no miracle, no fire from heaven, no word from God. It was such a bleak time in Israel's history that it was also called the Dark Period. Plato, who lived several hundred years before the birth of Jesus Christ, one day lamented, and I quote, maybe one day a logos, an explanation, or a word will come from God. In other words, maybe one day God will speak to humankind. The Apostle John wrote of Christ coming to earth by saying in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt or pitched his tent among us. Jesus Christ, you could say, shattered the silence of the heavens. In a matter of hours, God's angelic advertising agency would light up the once silent skies and deliver the unbelievable news that the word from God had come. The explanation from God had arrived in a most unexplainable way. And so I want to invite you back to our study this Christmas season of the details <coughs> surrounding the delivery and the announcement of the living word from God as we read about it in the Gospel of Luke. And again, I want to just encourage and invite you today. These tend to be scriptures that we've heard many, many, many times if we've been in the church. So I want to encourage you and invite you to just come with fresh ears, with a fresh mind with a fresh look at what God wants to speak to you and teach you today about this. Well, starting in Luke chapter 2, let's back up and just review a few things, uh, starting in verse 1 that we talked about last week. Verse 1 begins with this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. And you may remember, if you were with us last week in our study, that this was the first Caesar to claim the title Augustus, which meant Holy One. It was a name that had only been used in reference to the gods of Rome, but was now attributed to him. It would be this Caesar Augustus who would begin the veneration of Caesar, which would lead to worship. It would also lead to, for the Christians, great persecution as they would not acknowledge him but rather Jesus Christ as the only true and living son of God well if we continue to the latter part of verse 1 through verse 5 there in Luke chapter 2 it says that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to his own town to register so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. We touched on this last week, but Mary and Joseph were the scandal of Nazareth. These two Jewish young people who were betrothed at least as far as everyone was concerned, as, as far as it appeared, had evidently violated their vows of purity before their betrothal period, or Kiddushin, was fulfilled. The text tells us that Mary was with child. Mary was, in fact, nine months pregnant when she and Joseph left for Bethlehem. And as a result, they left their reputation behind. The accusation of Jesus Christ's illegitimacy would never be lived down. 
30 years later, when Christ was involved in declaring himself to be the Messiah, the Jewish leader scoffed at him and said, according to John chapter 8, verse 41, we were not born in fornication. In other words, we were not born out of wedlock like, wedlock, like you were. Based on the traditional age of betrothal and, and the information that we do have, Joseph was probably about 19 or 20 years of age at this time. Mary was younger, perhaps as young as 14 or 15. And in my studies this week, I was struck once again with the deep character and trust of both of these teenagers. They had complete trust in the Word of God. And this trust would help them overcome several major obstacles. And so this morning, I would actually like to share four major obstacles that they overcame. The first one I've already mentioned, and we spent time on it last week, and that was the unfair indictment or the pain of accusation. The pain that Mary, you know, of that accusation that Mary had to have been with someone. The pain for Joseph, the accusation that his betrothed had cheated on him. That pain that, again, would continue with them because even though the angel appeared to Mary and the angel appeared to Joseph and they trusted and believed in God, sort of that explanation to others, oh, no, 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 this is God's son. Yeah, right. You know, there would have been that pain of accusation, unfair indictment. Well, the second one was unexpected inconvenience unexpected inconvenience if you put the gospel accounts together you discover that joseph was spoken spoken to four times by god and after each revelation joseph was compelled to change something the first time he had to change his plans to put mary away which would have been the only thing he could have done to rescue his reputation over the course of their early marriage, Joseph was told to relocate three times. The first two years of Jesus' life, Joseph led his family as they escaped for their, lo for their lives to locations that God, through revelation, let Joseph know where to run next. Three times, Joseph had to reestablish his trade as a carpenter. Three times, he had to relocate his family and set up a new home. And he did this three times in less than three years. Verse 3, which we just read, begins their story with them on the road. They were pregnant, poor, isolated, and misunderstood. They would not feel at home any, anywhere for several years. The plan of God would forever change their lives. The will of God for Joseph and Mary would be terribly inconvenient. It would end any dream of a quote-unquote normal life, whatever that might look like. The will of God for them would rule out a comfortable life and would lead many times to total exhaustion. Now, if you ask the average believer, how do you know you're in the will of God? They might answer, when I understand the things that are happening. However, if you had asked Joseph that question, he would have answered, when nothing seems to make any sense at all. If you ask the average believer, how do you know if God is at work in your life? They might answer with something like, when things are improving and progressing, when everything seems to be working out as planned. However, if you had asked Joseph and Mary the same question, they would have said, when nothing gets better, when everything we ever thought would happen and everything we planned to happen has been turned upside down. Have have you ever heard a Christian say, 
God is so good to me, absolutely nothing is working out like I wanted. I, ha I haven't yet. But I think that is often the way God works. That it's different than the way we think or we plan. Joseph and Mary headed to Bethlehem. They packed enough for the 80-mile journey, but planned to return to Nazareth and set up their home and carpentry practice. They had barely gotten things set up when they had to flee in the middle of the night to Egypt. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 tells us that. Their lives would be filled with unplanned, unmanageable inconvenience. Their lives would also be pressured by a third obstacle. The third one I'll share, and that is unmistakable inadequacy. Unmistakable inadequacy. If you skip ahead to verse 21 of Luke chapter 2, we are told of an incident that occurred just days after Christ's birth. Let me read Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. On the eighth day... When it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves, or two young pigeons. This actually reveals the deep poverty of Joseph and Mary. There were other things prescribed by the law of God to offer to God at this particular dedication. They would certainly have wanted to pull out all of the stops. This son was the Messiah. And they were dedicating him to Yahweh. <coughs> Imagine the irony they may have felt in their hearts as they were dedicating God the Son to God the Father. But they bought two birds. The law of Moses indicated that the most prized, most expensive animal they could purchase to offer was a young, unblemished lamb. They were unable to afford a lamb, however, and had to buy the cheapest animals on the market, which were two common pigeons. This was an indication that they were truly, deeply poor. And they must have felt the full impact of their poverty at this moment. It is interesting to realize, though, at this dedication ceremony, they had brought a lamb, the lamb of God, Emmanuel, God who had come to be with us, to die for us, and to take our sins away. Imagine as well how inadequate they must have felt raising the Son of God. They were responsible for Jesus Christ's education in the Old Testament scriptures. They were to teach him the stories of the people of God, as well as her leaders such as Moses and Joshua. It was probably rather wonderful to teach Jesus the Psalms of David and tell him that he was the great, great, great something, grandson of David. I don't know how many greats there are. I didn't count them all. <coughs> and to tell him the story of Ruth and Boaz, and then inform him, inform him that Ruth was his great, great, great something grandmother. I can only imagine how inadequate these <coughs> two parents must have felt. There were no books at that time on how to raise kids, much less how to raise a Messiah. <laughs> and think about it. Can you imagine teaching the prophecies of Scripture to the one whom the prophets had foretold, or teaching the law to the one who would never break the law, or singing the messianic psalms to the Messiah. 
Their lives were full of unmistakable inadequacy. However, however, God said to them in effect, I want you to teach the written word to the one who is the living word. Before we go any further, I want to make one observation here. Being who you are, where you are, with the challenges that you face and the pressures that you have, whether it's in raising your children or walking with God in the midst of pressure or trusting God when his will for you is extremely inconvenient, we can learn a lot from these two faithful teenagers. And one important lesson to learn is that overcoming the obstacles and growing deeper in your faith when tested in your life does not require previous experience, but personal obedience. More than likely, the things that you are facing today are things that you may have never faced before. Things that you have no experience in to fall back on. Life is not like most job applications where you apply based on experience. Most of the time, God whispers into our hearts. You've never done anything like this before. There's no time to prepare. Just obey me today and I'll take care of tomorrow. Well, the fourth challenge or obstacle surfaced as I studied this text. Joseph and Mary not only experienced unfair indictment, unexpected inconvenience, and unmistakable inadequacy, but fourth, unfortunate indifference. Unfortunate indifference. Now look at the text we read to begin. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Hmm. Made me think that some things have not changed. The inn was overcrowded in that day, and the hearts of people are overcrowded today. They're still so often seems to be no room for Jesus. Justin Martyr, the second century church, church leader, stated that the specific birthplace of Jesus was a shallow cave that was used as a shelter for animals. This was a common practice in those days. And it's interesting that in the middle of the fourth century, the emperor Constantine ordered that the church be built over the supposed birthplace of Christ, and it was built over and against a Bethlehem cave. Now, as I was thinking about this whole thing and the scripture, there's no room for there was no room for him at the end. I have to admit, I have often wondered if Joseph argued with the innkeeper. But we have no indication that he did. There, there's nothing to say yes or no on that. It just makes me curious. We're simply from scripture told that the inn was full. As I was thinking about this, and this all makes sense in a moment, if you're like, what? Where are you going with this? Bear with me. Because as I was thinking about this whole thing, it actually reminded me of something that happened all the way back in the year 2000 when I worked as a youth pastor at Irvine Presbyterian Church. And that year, there was a brand new children's ministry director, Amy Brown, who was also teaching the second grade Sunday school class. And Nathan Roberts who was the senior pastor, Mark Roberts' son, was in her Sunday school class that year. And it was either the first or the second Sunday of the new school year. And after the Sunday school class ended that morning, Amy Brown went and to find Mark Roberts and talk to him. And she said, I, I need to tell you about something that happened this morning. And so he was listening and she continued, This morning after class, Nathan was getting ready to run out the door. And I reminded him that the rule states you cannot leave the Sunday school class unless a parent comes to pick you up. Nathan protested, I always do. 
I always leave right after class. And Amory replied, well, not anymore. Nathan continued his protest saying, but I do it every Sunday. My other Sunday school teachers let me. And Amy stated, well, I'm sorry, but I am your teacher now. And you cannot leave without a parent picking you up. Well, Nathan put his hands on his little seven-year-old hips and said, do you know who my father is? Pastor Mark. Amy just looked at Nathan square in the eyes and said, I don't care if he's Pastor Mark. You're not leaving this classroom. Nathan thought he had the ultimate connection to be able to run wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted. It made me think, Jesus Christ owned the world. So what do you mean there's no room in the inn? Do you know who his father is? <laughs> Talk about pulling strings. And while it might be true that yes, God could have done that, but that was not the way God had planned it. His plan was a stable. Now, whether it was a wooden stable or a cave in Bethlehem's hillside, what we need to do is we need to erase from our minds the Christmas card picturesque of fresh hay, clean animals, and a warm fire. In fact, the last thing you would ever do is build a fire in a stable around horses and donkeys. That cave was dark and cold. The night air was surely punctuated by Mary's cries of pain. Surrounded by manure and the stench of animals, the ground would have been packed hard by the animals or worse yet, muddied by the recent rain. Joseph I'm sure, made a soft place for Mary to lie. Perhaps he used his own cloak. We don't know how long her labor was. Perhaps it lasted well into the night. Perhaps Joseph held her hand, cooled her forehead, tried to encourage her, and shoot the animals away. Perhaps he wondered why it was happening like this and didn't know exactly what to do. Like most first-time parents, Joseph and Mary probably had a degree of uncertainty and fear about their first child. This was all new. Here were two kids. They were out of town and in a smelly, dark, dank stable. This was their first delivery and there were no nurses, no doctors or interns, no midwife, no mother or sister, and no friends anywhere to help. They were alone. As the pain and contractions increased, I'm sure the sweat and the fear increased as well. And Luke simply records in verse 7, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. Now, this was not Mary's only son, by the way. In, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, Mary and Joseph, Joseph's other sons are introduced to us by name. They had four more sons. However, Jesus was the firstborn. And as the firstborn, that actually meant he had the legal rights of inheritance. His mother and adoptive father were the descendants of King David. And therefore, Jesus inherited the right to claim the throne of David. He is the rightful king. But at this moment in that cave, which reeked of livestock and dirty hay, this baby seemed anything but a king. One author wrote, His face is prunish and red. His cry, though strong and healthy, is still the helpless and piercing cry of a newborn baby. This is majesty in the midst of the mundane. This is holiness in the filth of manure and sweat. This is deity entering the world on the floor of a stable through the womb of a teenager into the calloused hands of a young carpenter. 
Jesus did not come out with a halo. The animals did not kneel and worship him right there when he was born. He was an ordinary looking, sounding, and feeling baby. And after Mary swaddled him, that is, she wrapped him with strips of cloth, she was too exhausted to even hold him. So they laid their newborn baby in a manger. The Greek word that's used for manger is fotni, which can literally be translated feed trough. More than likely, as was the custom, it was a place cut along the side of the cave and hollowed out. Joseph evidently, we would assume, cleaned out a section of the trough as best as he could and put a blanket or some hay into it to cushion the baby. And then, in that feed trough, they laid the Son of God. You could not have chosen a more wretched place to be born than this. You could not have scripted a more humble, poverty-stricken beginning than this one. What a picture of God's condescension. He entered the world of sin. Perhaps, maybe, just perhaps, that stable serves as a metaphor of the filth of sinful humanity. He left behind the wealth of heaven and chose the rags of humanity. He could not have stooped any lower. Emmanuel, God with us, had come from riches to rags. Close with this simple, short, but I think profound poem. Mary had a little lamb. His skin was bronze and smooth. And everywhere that Mary went, she pondered in her heart the news. That this was not an accident or some inconvenient incident. No, this was planned since time long past. God's voice from a manger was heard at last. Amen. And if you will go ahead and stand, we will have our closing worship song and then our benediction.
now receive today's benediction, which comes from Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen.